Good afternoon and welcome to the 23rd annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. It's a changing field. There's always new things to talk about. Um, and uh, to talk about an innovation and an application specific for um, uh, homeowners, uh, among other things, I'll be uh, discussing with Alexander Dyke from Next Energy, um, ramping up the production of marketable fuel cell technologies uh, now and in the future. Please welcome with me Dr. Alexander Dyke. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Alex. So, um, not to say that everyone knows this probably anyway, but we should introduce the company. Uh, Next Energy, tell us a bit about it. Next Energy is a public research center uh, in, in the northwest of Germany where the earth is really flat and you can see who comes on, on, on the next uh, day to, for, for main, to maintenance your CHP unit. Um, <laughs> but even there the distance has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of wind and the sun is shining in this area where energy, the renewables are very strong in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's also why, why Next Energy was founded there 10 years ago. Um, to implement the renewables inside the energy, energy system on the northwest, mm -hmm. even if the power consumption is at the moment stronger in the, in the Bavaria or the southwest of, of, of Germany. Mm -hmm. But the power was generated now, the renewables, in a strong way, and uh, that's how we have to use it. And we have to design the energy system and the transition at this case. And the transition in this case, which is the key word here, um, uh, you have a wonderful device um, at your booth, uh, which I recommend everyone visit. It's D57. Um, it's uh, a four kilowatt uh, PEM stacks system, I should say. Tell us a bit about the system. What's unique? Fuel, fuel cells come in all shapes and sizes. What's specific to this device? This HTPEM fuel cell stack uh, was, was generated in a, in a European funded project system and it was a very successful project in, 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 in different cases in case we get some different targets and sizes projects and we achieved all goals that was set in this project um, with a three, only a three months delay. Um, and this was a CHP unit as with a CHP stack and uh, a, a reform with a scalable system. Mm -hmm. Normally, you have, if you design to a demand, um, then you have in the totally annual hours, 8,760 uh, hours, where you have a, need a full demand and then the, at zero hours you, you, you need only a, a few watt. And, and the, the middle range is this covers where you can cover the CHP most effectively. Nobody wants to give the last 10% where you have to spend a lot of power. And you, if you have some modules that could fit exactly to the demand of house or building system for a multifamily house, then you could fill, fulfill this with this four kilowatt stacks and a couple of them up to 100 kilowatt, you could fulfill the demand very precisely and um, never have to switch the off of the full system. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so um, amb ambitious goal, but it were, it was a successful goal that it is exactly this function in this way. Also, the, the reformer was developed new from ICI in this case, and uh, the stack was new developed um, with the lowest degradation rate at the moment that is reported for an HTPEM with below one fic four micro uh, volt per, per hour. So it's a, a tough target and we fulfilled it with this 160 degree uh, operation CHP system based on an HTPEM. Mm. Okay, there's so many details here and I want to go back and um, recuperate all the complexities here. Um, uh, two factors that are interesting, uh, one is the high temperature. Um, uh, uh, you define that as 160 degrees. Some PEM cells operate at around 100. Um, uh, so uh, I suppose this is related to the combined heat and power application. But um, you know, what are the benefits and drawbacks of a high temperature PEM cell? Um, and why did you opt, obviously, intentionally for the high temperature PEM cell? The high temperature PEM fuel cell has uh, the advantage to operate large, much higher than 100 degrees C. That makes one thing is you have a much better 
zero tolerance on the cell design, mm -hmm. so you can squeeze out one uh, clean gas fine shift on, on, the, on, the, on the fuel cell level or for the fuel cell, so, so you get also faster in the system in case you can leave one step out of the gas clean gas cleanup phase mm -hmm. and it's much easier to get temperature out of 160 degree temperature so 140 degrees C to even make steam from this and have an, an easy game to make heat to a house or a building even on a higher temperature level mm -hmm. so it makes uh, the, the outcoupling of temperature much much easier mm -hmm. but always if you have, you have if you have, advantage you, you must have also a drawback um, and it's obvious that at 160 degree C uh, water as a cooling agent will not be the best in case it will be a high pressure or, or if so it must be high pressurized so we have to switch the cooling liquid um, and the cooling liquid in this case has also some is one of the things where we have some delay inside the project. In case the cooling liquid was a liquid that has some different influences on the materials that used up to now. And this influence has to be covered by new material development to achieve the same stability in the materials to overcome the full runtime. Mm -hmm. No, uh, alone, the issue of um, uh, fuel flexibility uh, fascinates me. Uh, PEM cells uh, are traditionally the purest PEM cell, of course, is it runs on pure hydrogen and it um, produces electrical energy in water. Um, that pure fuel demand of the PEM cell technology, historically speaking, was a huge issue if there's any impurities, you have that degradation issue immediately. So, um, uh, two questions. The fuel flexibility, how do you define that? Secondly, what does this pen cell actually run on? Uh, do you need a hydrogen source? Do you run on natural gas? What do you use? Exactly in this project, European project, as we closed in last year, September, it was, we have the fuel flexibility we, where we use also hydrogen, also steam reform reformate and also on the other hand oxygen or enriched air by oxygen to see how if you can improve the efficiency on the fuel cell level and this was also be published in, in some documents where we, we where we can show that which influence we have and, it, and if this influences might be cost effective even to have the, to use the higher power output of the cell even for small demands to have some air bleed or something like that on, on the on the air side also on the fuel side so if there in the future will be electrolyzers to generate hydrogen from renewables to to squeeze them into the cell and and use them in in the HT PEM CHP system for a multi-family house. This was what all covered, and um, yeah, there, there, if there's a transition system uh, after the natural gas that we have inside the, the gas grid from today, and maybe in the future it will switch on to hydrogen, um, y yes, it's possible to use also this technology in a transition phase, and you don't have to change it mm. in principle. Mm -hmm. That's a good news. Yes, this is always, um, I, I, I like to refer to these as entrance technologies, although the technology itself remains constant. Um, when I say entrance technologies, I mean uh, it's hard to beat the affordability of natural gas, and we can't ignore its existence. Um, but uh, if these devices will operate on natural gas, uh, it allows us to start producing in larger numbers, um, uh, and that reduces production costs overall. It's an experiential thing as well. We learn stuff. Um, but it still raises the question, uh, you know, we're still using fossil fuels, so why would one bother to install um, a combined heat and power PEM cell uh, when you can use your own conventional um, gas burner? So CHP systems are very e efficient and you have the, the, the your normal gas heat appliances is not able to produce power. Mm. And um, the, the CHP makes it possible to use or generate your own power at home that will help to, to, make, to make the grids more stable in, 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 the, in the lower level. In case up, up to now the, the grids was, or the power grid was supplied by top-down, mm -hmm. uh, by central 
power generation, and, but now with, first with the solar panels and later on maybe yeah, with, with the CHP units, we could start light from, from bottom up and make uh, even we could avoid some installations of uh, power grid enhancement, even if we think to the near future where we have some cars that we want to charge. Uh, so we have an interchange even, even for, for the electric cars, and you could recharge by CHP running through the night, where you normally have no strong power demand. Normally I sleep during night, but um, and your, your power demand of the house gets down to 200 watt. Um, so normally you have to switch off your CHP unit. And with this future opportunity that it's also the CHP runs through with one kilowatt or two kilowatt and could charge your car over, overnight um, and generate the electricity you need and have the, you have the chance to reach the 5,000 hours and more of operation time for your CHP unit. Um, that makes it even in coming back to costs, um, you come to a benefit at the final end. In case at the moment the investment costs, even for funding, it, it, it's, it's lowered, uh, you come to earlier to break even for the, for the customer. And this, of course, is every um, energy efficient engineer's dream of uh, creating a decentralized uh, grid structure, local production and local consumption of electrical energy. Um, one can think of communities that share um, resources so that if one house has everything turned on at the same time, others in the community toss voltages back and forth. Somehow, so, but if, 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 if an, an, a new area was constructed for, for houses or allowed to build houses there, may, maybe the power grid must be, must be enhanced mm -hmm. in case there are some, will be some new houses in, near, nearby. Yeah, yeah. So and if they supply their, themselves, and it, it might be also an efficient house, uh, so the, fu the future house will have a much higher space heating demand, but you will still have some electricity demand and also tap water, hot water demand, and this, this could be fulfilled by a CHP unit in a precise way. Um, and be in, in an effective way. So, so even if it's a tr transition technology, you, the, the amount of CO2 that you can avoid is around up to 40%, and that is enormous mm -hmm. by doing no changing nothing inside the house. For a future house, it, you, by insulation or using um, efficient technologies for, for your fridge, uh, for lightning, for all the stuff that you can do by avoiding from the from the demand side, and how this could be fulfilled then in the near future, and it, and that's what we are working on. We we making standards or measurements on actual houses with different with families with two persons uh, w without childrens, uh, and they have a different demand, and this has also been fulfilled over the time, and and houses something like a living object. Uh, normally you go inside the house with two persons, uh, then maybe children uh, comes inside the house and they grow and have a get a, not, with 10 to 15 years they get, a, they get the idea to, to take a shower even in the morning and the afternoon, whatever, and with 18 they, they go away and the, the energy demand of the house will, will change over the years. And this CHP system is not changed over 15 or 20 years. And this could be adapted by a standard that we developed with a high resolution measurement inside, the, inside real profiles with a resolution of one and a half seconds, electric, electric and also from heat demand. And this makes a, a prediction for the future, which how, how architectures could implement CHP units or even old fashioned technology inside the house to, to have the right demand or fulfill the demand of the customer at, at the final end. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to have, uh, a warm living room and uh, mm -hmm. a warm shower whenever you like to do. Mm -hmm. And the lights on. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned a key word here. Um, when I look back over the 17 years I've been here, I've seen a few um, stationary applications for homeowners. 
Um, and it seemed to me in the past that it was uh, taking um, an approximation of what uh, electrical energy needs were there and dropping a fuel cell into the house and hoping they sometimes uh, match each other. What I find interesting about your approach is uh, you sat down and start to think about not only designing the uh, combined heat and power fuel cell unit for the house, but designing the house also uh, to match and wed well with the fuel cell unit. This makes perfect sense to me because architectural history is a story of um, a central fireplace in the living room and having that smokestack going up through the building and the luxury bedrooms are close to the smokestack because they're still warm. That is, houses were always designed um, uh, for heat. But you're really going into details here. Could you tell us a bit about this sort of architectural approach um, to homes with combined heat and power units? You can actually calculate them to each other. So, so what is you, which you should make first? You make first make the insulation to get the energy house uh, to make the warm the house warm to to drop it down to a, a convenient level, mm -hmm. and, and the second you make make installation of the CHP unit that could fulfill the demand. And sometimes the, even some electrical stuff inside. The, I, I always use the example of a hot water cooker where you switch on and that takes three kilowatt. Um, but on a 15 minute range, it's only a 600 watt. Right? That's normally every fuel cell could fulfill, um, but not the three kilowatt. So they have to de decide that you even shift some of the extra cost to the grid where it's better to have an uh, overall fluctuation in between. And the construction of the house is e even, you will not rebuild your house in total, but you can change uh, even inside the, your house some electricity demand, uh, some some new infrastructure will always take influence on, on the houses uh, for the near future. So, so nobody has a VLAN router 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the houses changes in, in case of space, living space for for the, for the people is increasing still. Mm -hmm. Only in cities it will get down again. Okay, we actually have so much more we could talk about. Um, the time is eventually um, going to run out on us. Um, but this is a conversation with immense amount of technical background to it and details. And what we really need to do is engage you at your booth, um, which is D57, um, uh, and there there's more space and time to go into the details. Um, some of the things we left out, the micro CT, they have a computer tomography to look at the heart of a fuel cell system. I find that fascinating. So you're the medical doctor of the fuel cells. Uh, something like that, but, but I still have to believe I, I'm a chemist. Um, okay. But if you need also some additional topics on another CHP project we have um, in work or online as D2 servers, and I will report on, an, on two o'clock uh, on, on the technical forum uh, if, if you're interested in technical details. Okay, so two o'clock at the technical forum, and if not that, D57, the booth uh, for Dr. Alexander Dyke, who's from Next Energy. It's a pleasure talking to you, Alexander. I hope I see you here next year. I hope to. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And thank you. Um, we will be continuing on stage in a few seconds with Robin, my colleague, and she'll be talking to Callum McConnell, who's from uh, Hydrogen Fuel Cell Initiative in Hessen, and they'll be talking about the role of networks for facilitating um, hydrogen and fuel cell tech uptake. So please stay tuned. The drinks are on the house. Have a seat and enjoy the talk. <laughs>